Hello, hello. Happy Wednesday. It's Birth Prep 101 tonight. Let's load on. Tell me where you're from. I like to know who and where I'm educating to on this planet when I come live for this hour with you guys. So let me know where you're from. It's fun to see you all the places around the world. Hey, hey, hey. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Texas, you're you're close to me. Maryland. Australia. Another Maryland. Awesome. New York. Aruba, New Mexico, Houston, Texas, Kentucky, Minnesota. This is exciting. We're everywhere. South Carolina. Tennessee, first baby, awesome, another Texas, North Carolina again, good, Florida, look at this, we're like all over the place, Canada, Rhode Island, Ohio, another New York, Netherlands, this is so fun, Missouri, <laughs> exciting, London, good, India, Yay! I'm so excited we're all coming together in one spot for one hour to get educated. Got Kansas, another India. All right. Well, I love you too, France. Thank you for being here. All right, so we're going to get started, okay? So I'm Krisha Crosley, Serenity Life Doula. I'm a certified birth doula, childbirth educator. Uh, belly binding specialist, essential oil educator, breastfeeding educator, and I'm your natural birth trainer. That's my gig. I like to train expecting parents for natural birth. I love it. I love it. I love it. I am a natural birth doula. My passion lies with first-time moms and women with the heart of an athlete who desire a home or birth center birthing experience. I only do home and birth center births. I've been a certified birth doula for over nine years, but I have taken my practice out of hospital five years ago. So I've done natural births for five years. It's pretty awesome. So uh, I love it, and it is what has helped me be who I am today, able to turn around and train you guys based on what I observe at natural births, and it's awesome. So now I'm sharing this knowledge with you. So a little bit personal about me. I have been married to the love of my life for 26 years. We have two bigs, a 23-year-old boy who weighed in at 9 pounds 8 ounces and a 21-year-old girl who weighed in at 9 pounds 14 ounces. Yes! Oh my gosh! They were legit big babies. <laughs> and yes, I birthed both of those babies vaginally and yes, it can be done. Uh, which leads us to the first thing I'm going to cover. There's a couple things I get asked repeatedly, like almost daily of the same few things, which we're going to kick off this Birth Prep 101 first with, and then we're going to get into the 20 questions to ask your healthcare provider. At the end, when I'm done, I will open it up to a live Q&A, and you can ask me any question except a medical question, because I'm not medically trained, and I will not answer a medical question. Okay, uh, so anything about being a doula, discomforts, what to do, things like that, I'm happy to give you resources or educate that on, or my philosophy or opinion. Remember, this is, this is me communicating you based on what I have observed and been through as a birth doula, trainer, things like that. Okay, so big baby, especially within the United States. I can't speak for all countries, but... One in three moms will be told they are going to have a big baby. Really? Do we have big babies coming out of one in three vaginas? I don't think so. 1.3% will actually be a big baby. I fell in that 1.3% two times. But that's okay. I could still birth them. I'm created to birth my babies. And I personally am a true believer your body will not grow a baby bigger than it can birth. Right? Our body is amazing. And the communication between your body and your baby's body is, is awesome. Okay? And that's part of why I teach and I train to build your confidence level up so you also believe that yes, you can. 
So 1.3 will actually have big babies. So pay attention to this wording when we're talking to our healthcare providers and they're leaning into you. Oh, you're measuring kind of big. You're measuring a few weeks ahead of time. Oh, you got a big baby in there. And then we have some of you that are completely flipped and they're telling you, oh, your pelvis is too small. You can't fit a baby through that pelvis. Well, how the heck do they know, right? Our pelvis is amazing. Our pelvis has four joints in it which actually causes our joints to stretch and move and change position. With this beautiful relaxant hormone, you're gonna have full on throttle in your body at the time of giving birth, okay? Amazing, your pelvis will stretch out. It's not too narrow, your baby ain't too big, okay? You've gotta believe in that, that yes you can. These are scare tactics. These are tactics to get you on the induction line or the cesarean lineup, okay? So pay attention to that stuff. These are just kind of like red flags that are popping up from your provider, uh, leading in you to a direction that you may not desire as a birthing experience. Remember, this is your body, your birth, your baby. What do you want for a birthing experience, okay? If it is an unmedicated birth, Go for it. Align yourself with the proper birth team. If you want an epidural birth, go for it. Align yourself with the right birth team. If you want a cesarean birth, go for it. Line yourself up with the right birth team. Okay? Keep those around you close who are going to help you get that birthing goal that you desire. Next, let's talk about let's talk about dilation. You guys, dilation is overrated severely overrated. It's another thing that we think we have to be dilated before we go into labor. All you first time mommies out there, don't expect to be dilated, especially if you ain't having contractions. So, this is our uterus. Now, this is your warning because this is a balloon and sometimes balloons pop. I have no control over it. Just like we have no control over when babies are gonna be born. They come when they're ready. Okay, this is a balloon. Let's pretend like it's your uterus. And we have this little ping pong ball in here that's we're gonna be your baby's head. And this is your cervix, okay? So right now we have a very long, thick cervix that's closed shut. Yeah, you're in pregnancy. Should be like that. Are you having contractions? No, oh, okay. Then it should be closed, thick, and pointed to the back, pointed towards your tailbone, posterior. That's where our cervixes are supposed to be. Now when we start getting into labor, things will change. If you're a second, third, fourth plus time mommy, you might open up a little bit sooner because your body's done it already again. It's like, oh, let's go, I'm ready whenever, right? So it's okay to not be dilated or opened up or anything at the end of pregnancy. You need contractions. So when it's time to have a baby, your baby will cough this enzyme. It's a hormone exchange between baby and you, and it's gonna to communicate to your brain. It's gonna raise the hormone levels needed to cause contractions in your uterus, okay? So that's why dilation's overrated. When you can have contractions and you're in labor, and I'm talking like throes of labor, like contractions three to four minutes apart, lasting greater than a minute for a couple of hours, we're like in labor. Not seven, eight, nine, ten minutes apart. That ain't labor. Mm -mm. That's warm up. Okay? That's when we're going to see cervical change. Is in those three to four minutes, hard contractions, intensity, you know, that's when we see it. Pressing down. Pressing down. See, then we get change. We start to get a shorter cervix. We start to see, ooh, dilation, which is the opening of the cervix. The thinning out of the cervix is called effacement, and it's done in a percent. Dilation is done in centimeters, which we're pretty familiar more with that. When we open up from one all the way over here to 10, where we're, you, we see a baby coming out, um, that's where we want to get. But we need strong, consistent, long contractions to get dilation. And when we start having those long, strong contractions, we have a lot more cervical change and we have a lot more opening up of the cervix, okay? This is what creates dilation, not just sitting there at the end of pregnancy. See how we get bigger and bigger? We've got lots of pressure, pushing baby's head down, and then you're gonna have as many contractions as you need before this baby decides 
to come see you. Ah, scare ya? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Dilation is overrated. Your body will open up when your body's ready to have a baby. And you've got to believe that. Okay? Next, number one sign of labor is what? Contractions. Not this. Not your water breaking. What we see in TV, what we see in Hollywood, we think is the number one reason for contractions. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay? That's only 10%. 90%. You're going to have contractions first, and your water don't break until right before you have a baby. That's naturally where our water's supposed to break. Eight, nine, ten, boom. Body pushes out a baby. Okay, that's what I see in my world a lot. Okay, we don't live in a perfect world. We know this. Okay, not everything's perfect. But what I see, that's what's happening. Okay, so... Contractions. Your body will contract. Your water will break later. Okay? All right. Number one sign of labor. Contractions. Write that down. Estimated due date. It's an estimation. It's a guess. Who knows? Only 5% of the babies are going to agree. That's my due date. I like that estimated due date, and they're born on that due date. But most, 95% of your babies, mm -mm, they don't agree with that. So they're going to come a little early. They're going to come a little later. And that's okay. When babies are ready, babies will cough the hormonal enzyme to send a signal to your brain for labor to start. That is how birth starts. So when you're up in my DMs going, what can I do to induce labor at 37, 38, 39, 40, 41 weeks? I'm going to be like, nothing. Be patient. Let's be patient. Remember the the stress and the anxiety on come on, we gotta have this baby. Come on now, come on now. You're getting closer to your estimated due date. We gotta have this baby. Come on, come on, come on. That is coming from your healthcare provider and all the people around you on social media and in your ear about, oh my gosh, you're so late. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay? Patience. There's nothing to rush about birth in most cases. Okay? Remember, we don't live in a perfect world, but in most cases. We need to be more patient, and we just don't got it. Society is very high-pressured, high-stress, high-anxiety. Come on now, look quick, 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 quick. Uh-uh, not for birth. Okay? Estimated due date. If you're a first-time mommy, you just might as well plan to be pregnant until you're 41 plus 3, because that is average. Yes, 41 weeks plus 3 days. That is very average. Okay? Second-plus-time mommies, not as much, a little over 4 weeks. Okay, those are averages. You may fall in above or below those. Those are fine. But just get your wits around the fact that you're going to be pregnant that long. And if you have providers saying, oh, you cannot absolutely not go past 40 weeks. We don't allow you to go past 41 weeks or whatever may be coming out of their mouth. Think to yourself, does this person agree with what my philosophy of birth is? Is this person going to help me get my birthing experience that I want? Okay, you need to think about these things. This is why we're having these conversations here. And there's two models of care. You have patholo pathology, path pathologically, and you have physiology. Woo! Twist, tongue twisters tonight, okay? Pathology is looking for stuff to fix to procedure, to surgery, to doctor, to medicate. Physiology is let's sit back and watch how the, what the body's created to do and let's let the body do its own thing, right? There's two different philosophies. What philosophy do you like? Which philosophy do you agree on? Depending on which philosophy you agree on, that is the model of care you need to have surrounded around you, birth team wise. Okay? I'm physiology. You're created to birth your baby. You will stretch just enough to have your baby. Let's do it. Okay? Sometimes pathology is necessary to have a baby, and that's okay. But that's sometimes. That's like, 
really small choice. A lot of us are being told we're high risk and you truly ain't high risk. Okay, this is where you need to do your homework, you need to do your research, you need to find your resources, your proper birth team. Okay, so decide which one you want and that's where you should be. It's your choice, your body, your birth, your baby. All right, so now let's get into these 20 questions to ask your healthcare provider. The, this is the handout. So if you register for class, uh, the email has gone out multiple times today with the handout. It will go out again tomorrow. So for those of you who are popping on and you're like, ooh, I want that, uh, it will go out again tomorrow, but you do need to register. If you haven't registered for class, you won't get the email or the, the handout, okay? So these are just 20 questions I came up with to help get the conversation started. You walk into your prenatal, some of you are like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to ask. You're a first timer, you have no clue what to ask. Some of you are like on it and know what to ask. It may give you some more questions to ask. You can ask all 20 of these. You can pick and choose which one you wanna ask or you can create your whole own list. These are just kind of to get you thinking. When you walk into your next prenatal, take the list with you. Add questions on the back or put it in your phone or whatever. Don't walk out without it. You're going to get your appointment and you're going to forget. Okay, pregnancy brain drill. Believe me, it's real. So the first one is how long will you let me go past your estimated due date? So if you're wanting a natural birth experience, so this is a natural birth platform because I'm a natural birth trainer and doula. So most of you, the majority of you want a natural birth experience. So natural birth is a baby coming out of the vagina. Some of, we can, some of us consider it an unmedicated birth. Some of us consider just having a vaginal birth, whether we're unmedicated or epidural. But it's having a baby how we're created to have a baby. And it's very, very few who follow my platform uh, that will have a cesarean birth. Um, so how long will you let me go past your estimated due date? If you want a natural birth experience, there should be no stop on, well, if you're not having a baby by this day, so sorry, you have to be induced, okay? Shouldn't be like that. Now, some of us run into state laws, like in the state of Texas where I'm in, we're like, you have 42 weeks to have your baby, or if you're at a hospital, your care has to transfer to an OB at a hospital, okay? Now, I have had OBs have clients who have gone a couple days past 42 weeks, okay? So, because it's just the, the care has to transfer and then it goes from there based on what's going on. Sometimes, us women ovulate late. We have late ovulations. We may be stressed. We may just draw ovulated, you know, 14 days past our last period versus 7 days. And that's what could run us up against 42 weeks, okay, or a little bit later. And then some states or countries don't have those rules. So, those are some examples of... Uh, cutting off dates, and then you have some providers that are like, well, I don't let anybody go past 40, or I don't let anybody go past 41. And there are some that don't allow moms to go past 39. And that's, oof, those are tough, inductions are tough, I'm not going to lie, they're tough, okay? What should I expect during my labor and delivery experience? If your answer comes back to that and you're like, oh, you're going to learn it on the day you go into labor, woohoo, that's a warning. Okay, uh-uh. They should be educating you, all providers. They are teachers. They are instructors. They need to be educating you. They need to be doing up here like I'm doing to you, right? They need to be educating you. If they're not educating or they're not sending you resources for childbirth classes that will help you get educated, mm, that's a warning. You need to be educated. If you're following me or you're on this live, you're not a wing it kind of person. You want to know, which is great because, oof, I'm with that. Educate, know, and train. Okay? If you're going to wing it, expect to get a winged <laughs> delivery experience what may not be what you want at all. And it might be a little bit shocking. Okay? This is why we're educated. So we know and we can make decisions. Educated decisions. Because whose birth is this? It's the one you're going to talk about for the rest of your life. Okay? whatever number baby it is. Women always talk about their birth experiences for the rest of their life. It is conversation all the time. What type of experience do you want to share with people? Okay. What is your philosophy on pregnancy, labor, delivery, and postpartum care? This is important. What is their philosophy? Does their philosophy match what you have 
going on in your brain of what you want for your birthing experience. If not, you're in the wrong place. You need to change providers. I don't care what week you are. 36, 37, 38 weeks. Yeah, it'll be stressful. You can change providers. You're still pregnant. All right, hopefully you're up on a ball. Bounce. We've been in for a few minutes. We're going to drink some water. We're going to practice good habits, good movement. Drink in your water. I forgot to mention at the beginning, but I expect everyone up on a ball, not lower recline and back in your sofa on your chair so we can move around. I teach them a ball. Let's be active. Proper body position, getting our babies in a good birthing position, doesn't matter what week gestation you are. Okay, we can all practice. When do you recommend I come to the hospital birth center for late, uh, during labor? It really depends on your provider. If you're birthing at home or birth center, you're going to be like a three minute apart contractions lasting for a minute for a couple of hours, especially for first time moms, second plus time moms, maybe not that long, but the contractions will be a lot stronger before your midwife comes out to you or you go into the birth center. In a hospital setting, you're going to be told, more than likely, especially within the United States, 511 pattern. Your contractions are five minutes apart from the start of one contraction to the start of the next. Lasting an entire minute for an hour. I'm telling you, that's going to be way too early. You're going to be doctored and done stuff to hurry up this labor because you're there too early. Okay? Contractions will get a lot closer together, a lot more rhythmic, a lot stronger lasting longer before you're going to spit out a baby, okay? 511 is too long, but that's what hospital, most hospital settings are telling you. If you want a natural, unmedicated birth, no intervention birth, and you're birthing in a hospital, you labor at home as long as possible. All you have to do is walk across the threshold of the front door and birth your baby. You missed it all, okay? Um, I've had a few people take me up on that. It was awesome to hear their stories. <laughs> All right. Five, what should I do if my water breaks suddenly at home or in labor? So your water can possibly break a little bit earlier. So depending on who your healthcare provider is, depends on what your answer is going to be. Some of us are going to be like, rush in, come on now, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Okay, and then some of us are going to be like, oh, how you doing? What's going on? Let's get some sleep. Contact me back in a few hours. Let me know when contractions start. Okay, because... It does happen sometimes. There's a couple things you want to notice. It's an acronym called COAT. Color, odor, amount, time. Color. What color is the fluid? It should be clear. We don't want yellowish color. We don't want greenish color. But sometimes it happens. Clear fluids. Yellowish tint. You may pee on yourself. Put your panties in a Ziploc bag for 15 minutes. Open it up. It smells like urine. You peed on yourself. Our baby uses our bladder like a trampoline. Sometimes they nick it just right and you're like, oh, <clears throat> you missed it. Couldn't clench hard enough. Peeing on yourself a little bit. It happens. Put a panty lighter in. Go about your day. If, it, it, uh, if it's greenish tint, your baby had its first bowel movement, which means that's the, it's called meconium. It's the waste that's in the baby's intestines. Comes out in utero and it turns the liquid a greenish color. Uh, baby has full functional intestines, had to poop, couldn't wait to come out. Okay? Um, depending on your healthcare provider, depending on how it's handled. It is handled very differently from country to country and client to client based on who your provider is. Some people make a huge or bigger deal out of it than it should be. Okay? So, um, if your water should break, do contact your healthcare provider and then y'all can talk it out from there. Um, o is odor, it should not smell. A is amount. Now, we talked about this earlier. We have the, oh my gosh, gush that we see 100% of the time in Hollywood, how labor starts, right? Gush, oh my gosh, everybody panics, and three minutes later, you have a baby after a commercial. Now, or you could have the trickle. Starts and stops, right? So that's a higher leak. It's higher up on the belly up here, and it kind of trickles down, and it stops. You move around, change positions, comes more, comes out, then it stops because the baby's plugging the hole. Um, that's also how water can break. It's not always a gush of water, nor is it always at the beginning. Sometimes it could happen any time during labor. 
Uh, most of the time it should happen right before the baby comes on. After your water does break and you are already contracting, your contractions will be a little bit stronger because your body knows that it's supposed to push a baby out after the water breaks. But if it breaks early, it's just not time to push the baby out, but the contractions will be stronger. So I do encourage you, oh, this is the next question. Do you routinely water to speed up labor, break water? Do you routinely break water to speed up labor, right? I highly, highly recommend to leave your body alone in the water bag. Your baby is surrounded by a double sac, which has the amniotic fluid in it. So your baby uses that amniotic fluid to get in a really good position to actually drop into the pelvis and navigate the way out, right? Your baby needs that water. Not to mention, that's your baby's protected coat. It protects your baby from the bacteria all out here, right? And what could be going up into the vaginal canal. So why are we breaking it? Why are we taking a protected barrier away from our baby if it hasn't broken yet? It will break on its own. If not, then your baby will be born in the water sack and that's okay. Okay, leave the bag of water there. It does not speed up labor, okay? What it does is it puts you on a clock and then you're gonna be pressured more with more interventions to hurry up and have labor and then the C word's gonna start happening. Well, you're not having your baby fast enough so we need to start looking at having a cesarean because risk of infection. Really? They gave you that risk of infection by breaking your water. If you allow it, remember, it's your body. You have to give consent. I'm just encouraging you to leave your baby protected until it breaks. It'll break on its own. And that way, it also doesn't put you on a clock. It gives you more time to labor if you need more contractions and a little bit more time to labor. Okay? It is okay. Seven, can I change positions in labor and push in different positions? If you want a natural birth experience, it's hard to do just laying there doing nothing. Or if policy says I have to be in a bed. Home and birth center birth, you're going to be expected to move and change positions all across the house or the birth center. They don't expect you to just lay in a bed. It's hospital policy sometimes. Oh, once you walk to the door, you're a liability. You're a fall risk, so you need to get into the, the bed and not move. That is hard to have a natural birth. Your body needs to move and change positions and bend and squat and lunge and all this to, you know, remember to move and change this pelvis for the baby to wiggle through. It's very, very important. Okay? So you want an environment you can place. Sometimes it's the policy of the birthing environment. Sometimes it's the policy of the provider. So you need to ask both. If you're birthing in a hospital, which most of you are birthing in a hospital that registered for class, so I speak more along the lines of that, is go visit the environment. Most places are, the COVID stuff is over. Most places, I know some places are still a little bit behind, but go visit. Or better yet, call your L&D and ask questions, right? At nighttime, after nine o'clock, after shift change of the nurses, Call L&D and say, hey, I have a couple questions. I'm planning the birth there on such and such month. Can you answer them for me? They would be happy to answer questions for you. Find out what the hospital policies are. Okay? You can also ask your provider. Uh, where did I leave off? Eight, I think. Yes. Do you offer continuous fetal monitoring or intermittent monitoring? So at a hospital, they're going to use that little handheld microphone with the box on it with the coil in between. That's a handheld Doppler, and that's what they use in home births or birth center births. Very few hospitals will use it if requested. Most hospitals use the discs. So you have a disc here, and you got a disc down here. The top one is for uterine contractions. The bottom one is uh, listen to baby's heart rate. And when you walk in to hospitals, triage, you like they like to get a 20 minute strip. So listen for baby for 20 minutes and then they'll see whether they're going to admit you or not, depending on other things. So you can ask for continuous or intermittent monitoring. I think most try to do continuous, but you can do intermittent monitoring, which is listen for 20 minutes off, listen for 20 minutes off. 
out of hospital settings, they're in there listening for whatever time it is. Sometimes it's a minute, sometimes it's 30 seconds, and then they're off for a while. And the closer you get to having your baby, the more frequent they, they listen. So it's very intermittent out of hospital. In hospital, if you're on continuous monitoring, your move space is in bed or right next to bed. You don't have much freedom. If you're low risk, there's no reason for continuous monitoring. If you have an epidural, you've been on some type of pain medication, or you're being monitored for some other medical reason, you're going to be, have continuous monitoring. Okay? You can also ask for a, a wireless monitor. So that's a monitor that is put on your belly, and it works on Bluetooth, and then you can um, walk around with it, change positions or whatever, depending on what's going on with your labor. Okay, so you have options there. But if you're low risk, intermittent monitoring is fine. Nine, what are your induction methods? Ten, what is my bishop score and is my cervix favorable for induction? All right, we're going to do these together. So I get a lot of questions about natural induction. i got to naturally induce. Again, why? Patience. If you do all the things to try to get natural birth going at 38, 39, 40 weeks, and you're still pregnant at 41 plus 5, and you've done all the things, do you think what you've been doing is going to work now? No, your body's used to it. Stop doing all the natural inductions all those times. Can we just, like, take a deep breath and be like, oh, I am thankful and grateful for this pregnancy, and be pregnant and take it day by day? Yeah, I know some of you are like, I'm so done. Yeah, I'm sure. I've been pregnant twice. I get it. Right? But remember, this is the experience you're going to talk about for the rest of your life. This is how you create this experience. Okay? Don't do all the natural birth induction stuff. Weeks. Patience. Then if we need to throw something in there at the end, because you're running against a state law or something like that, you have an arsenal of things you can do to jumpstart you. Okay? Because you haven't tried nothing yet. All right, so things we do, if for some reason you have to be induced for a medical necessary reason, holidays are not a medically necessary reason to be induced, big baby is not a medically necessary reason to be induced, too small pelvis is not a necessary reason to be induced, right? Medical reason, okay? Like you got something going on with your blood pressure. Yeah, that's not a good thing. So let's get that handled type of thing. That's medical. Um, things that you can do is, one, you want to talk about your bishop score. Is your cervix favorable or unfavorable for induction? Or if maybe you're pressured in or maybe you decide you want to induce because you're over it and it's your decision, okay, fine. Or maybe your spouse is going out of town and you have to have the baby. Or maybe you have family coming in and you have to have the baby. Maybe your OB is going out of town and you have to have the baby or midwife or whatever. Right? There's all the reasons, but those are not medical reasons to be induced. These are reasons you're choosing to or you're being pressured into. Um, you want to know your bishop score. Are you favorable or unfavorable for induction? So this will basically increase or decrease the vaginal birth rate. Okay. If you're closed shut, you're thick, and you're pointed backwards posterior, the likelihood of having a vaginal birth is minute, very small. Because your body's not ready. Your body's showing absolutely no signs of having a baby. So if your body's showing no signs of having a baby, who else isn't ready to be born? Our baby. Okay? So that's when if you throw an intervention on this, an unfavorable cervix, and you're not changing fast enough and you're shocking your system because your body's not ready and you're like you're gonna have a baby you're gonna have a baby with medical induction your body gets stressed out and then your baby starts to get stressed out and then your baby's like oh I tap out I'm out peace out come and get me I can't handle this anymore okay that's where your your that really decreases your vaginal uh, experience quickly. Induction should be slow. You have to give your body time to adjust. So induction should last three to five days. Don't expect to go in the same day and have a baby that same day if you wanted vaginal birth. Okay? Three to five days. Slow induction. Give your body time to adjust. Give your baby time to adjust on what's going on. It's not this fast. 
And that's what we're seeing. How fast can we get you in the bed, out the bed, and baby in the crib? Okay, keep that in mind if you consent to this. If your cervix is favorable, maybe you're three centimeters dilated, you're 50% effaced, your cervix is nice, movable, you're like soft down there, um, then your body's showing signs, hey, I'm getting ready, I'm prepping to have a baby. Then your chance of a vaginal delivery with an induction does increase. Okay? Um, so these are things you want to think about if you're considering induction. Now, to have a Bishop score done, that is a vaginal check or cervical exam, whatever you want to call it, um, that happens. Okay? If you're not into vaginal checks or cervical exams, then you're not going to know what your Bishop score is, so then it's going to be a harder decision to make about induction. I do not encourage vaginal checks at the end of pregnancy. They're pointless. What are they going to tell you? You're closed shut, not ready to have a baby? Yeah, probably so. And then your mind's like, oh my God, my body's failing me. It really lowers our mental, mental state when we're told that. Okay? Are you contracting? Remember, contractions cause cervical change. Okay? All right. So these are things you kind of got to get your, like, mind and wits about and uh, figure this stuff out for what you feel is best for you and what direction you want to go. This is why we have education. So you can make educated decisions on what you feel is going to work best for you. Because some of us are going, oh, I don't want that. That ain't going to work for me. Yeah, you probably shouldn't do it then. If you're like, oh, no, that's fine. I got it. I like that part. Okay, then you probably should do it. Okay? Go with what indicates to you. So induction methods, if your body's opened a little bit more, right? So like open one or two centimeters. Uh, there could be stripping of membranes, which is inserted fingers into the cervix to the top, and then they split the fingers, and they literally strip the membranes because your baby's stack and baby is up above on the top part of the cervix, and then they strip it. So then you'll have bloody mucusy stuff come out of your body. You might feel like a little bit of crampy, and it could put you in labor. It could. You usually have to have several stripping of membranes to, for it to be affected, and you also have risks with that. If you would like more information about that or anything I'm talking about, you can DM me or send me an email, and I'm happy to provide a resource for you so you can observe the information with your own eyes and make a decision for yourself. Um, that's one thing. Some do a Foley bulb or a cook bulb, which is actually they place a balloon type thing up into the cervix, which is maybe one centimeter open or two, and then they inflate it with water or air, and then it will actually open the cervix up to about three or four centimeters, and then it usually falls out, which could make you crampy, could kick you off in the, into labor. Okay, these are options. And then you have the medical type of medication to help, which would be Cytotec or Cervidil, Prostaglandin Jill. Some of these go down the hatch. Some of them go up by the cervix, depending on what you're doing, which could make you crampy, which could send you into labor or may not. We all respond differently. I don't know. These are just things that are used. And then the most common one we're used to is Pitocin. So that is in an IV bag that comes through an IV into the heplock into your body and it is monitored by the nurses and increased so much um, so after so long until those contractions get a little bit stronger which usually hits you all of a sudden okay because your body's not used to it and it gets a lot in your body before your body catches up and realize oh wait a minute i'm supposed to be contracting and there's contractions come out of nowhere that's why we hear all these stories about pitocin and oh my gosh that don't feel so great Okay, so these are all ways it could be used for inductions, and they could also be used as a cascade of interventions. They'll use one, and then they'll use the next, then they'll use the next, and then you have all the interventions. And then that what could lead into an epidural, which could lead into some other things that could lead into some other things. Okay, um, some work really great, some don't work really great. So educate yourself. This is why we have a full childbirth education class because I can't cram all this in an hour. There's just no way. Okay. These are just tidbits to get your mind thinking. It's having a hep lock or IV routine. So hep lock is this. IV is the bag hanging out of hospital. It is option in hospital. It may be required a policy by the provider or the doctor. If you are scared to death of needles, this might concern you. You may not want to have that. 
It's not required in all places. You can say no thank you. It is a preparation for surgery. Are you comfortable with me eating and drinking in labor? Ooh, oh, love this one. Yes, the answer just needs to be yes. But some of you are gonna to be told, oh, you can't do that. Do you expect to have a baby 24, 36 hours with no food or water? That's ridiculous. Do you go 24, 36 hours right now without working hard, without food or water? Absolutely not. Why are we taking away from moms who are working hard? Contracting, 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 bending over, moving, changing, pissing, moaning. That's a lot of exertion. That's a lot of energy. You got to have fuel for your body. You got to have hydration for your body so your body can work properly. And then you get told, oh, failure to progress. Yeah, no joke. Your body doesn't know how to function. It's hungry and it's, it's, it's dehydrated. It's going to stall, okay? Simple, simple, easy things. Eat, drink can prevent stalls. You need to eat and drink, okay? They are prepping you for surgery. At a hospital, you're going to be like, take a drink, take a bite, take a drink, take a bite. You will be fueled and hydrated properly out of hospital. In hospital, some, very few will do it, but most will tell you, nope, they're preparing you for surgery, okay? I want you to remember, this is my analogy, that if someone were to go eat a fabulous dinner, and on the way home something happens and they wind up in the hospital and they need life-saving emergency surgery, do you think they're going to look at that person and go, I'm sorry, when was the last time you ate? Oh, I'm sorry, we can't operate. You're too full. No! <laughs> The great thing about hospital staff is they are trained in emergencies and they are going to step in and do what they know best and handle the emergency and anything that happens in that situation. They know how to do it. They are highly skilled professionals and we thank God for them, right? When we need them. So just think about that. Eat and drink before you go in and just be honest the last time you ate and drank. They can handle it. So can you. Next, 13, if I desire an all-natural birth, will you be willing to support me in that decision? If you want a natural, unmedicated birth, you need to find a provider that has seen and does many, 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 many times a natural, unmedicated birth. If they're used to running everybody through the epidural line for medication, where do you think they're going to guide you on your birth? And you're going to go like this. And when you're in the throes of labor, you will welcome anything. Okay? So think about that. So if you want a natural unmedicated birth, then you need to find a natural unmedicated birth team. If you plan to get that epidural at six centimeters or you plan to have an epidural birth period, you need to have a good epidural birth team and they have a great anesthesiologist to get it right the first time. Okay? If you want a cesarean birth, then you need to go into a hospital and a provider that has a great cesarean rate because that's how they like to do surgeries and you're going to be in great hands. Match yourself up with the providers. You may have to do interviews. Some of you are going, oh my gosh, I'm doomed. No, you're not. Put your running shoes on and run. Go find another one. What is your cesarean rate? What is the hospital cesarean rate? Okay. Same reason. What are the rates? You don't want to walk in in a 60% cesarean provider or hospital and you want a natural birth. They're going to lead you right on up to that cesarean rate because that's how they like to deliver babies. That is where they're competent in their skill set. If you want a natural unmedicated birth, you need to find a provider that is competent and knowledgeable in the skill set of natural birth. Okay? Just like me. I'm competent in natural skill set birth as a doula and a trainer. If you want a natural birth experience, come train with me. I'll train you. I'll teach you exactly what happens and how to get through it, how to prepare for it with my Train for Birth workshop. Fifteen is performing a Pisiotis party routine delivery. So that is a cut. Grab my other pelvis here. So that is a cut from the bottom of the vagina down to the anus to make the opening for the baby to cross the finish line bigger, okay? Some countries, it is routine. I get this in my DM all the time with countries in Asia, okay? It's routine, and women are scared to death of it because they don't want to be cut. I don't blame them. I don't want to be cut either. Nobody wants to be cut. Um, 
but it's overly used. It used to be huger in the United States back before the 90s, 80s, and things like that. It's not so much now, but we still have providers, and it's routine. They'll keep those scissors nice and close to cut your perineum. It is a for sure cut. It is for sure stitches. Your body is freaking amazing when it comes to birth. It knows to stretch. You have the hormones raging in your body to help your body stretch. Getting into the proper position. Breathing your baby down and not purple face pushing. <laughs> helps not tearing. You have a great chance of not tearing and your body stretching. Being coached through it. Another thing I coach you and train for birth. Okay? What is your on-call schedule? Hey, if you really like your provider, you might want to know if they're going to be around on your due date. If they're in a small practice of a couple, two or three doctors or midwives, the likelihood of having your provider is high. But if they're in the practice of 10, 12, 13 doctors or midwives, your chances of having your provider are very low. This could be important to some of you. Ask the questions. What is the likelihood you will deliver my baby? Will this person go the extra mile and come in anyway? There are professionals out there that will do that. But have you asked? You don't ask, you don't get. Find out. You might have one of those professionals and that is awesome. Does your backup have similar philosophy for delivering babies as you? You love your doctor. You love your midwife. Well, they could have a family emergency. They may have to go out of town or they may become ill. Right? And all of a sudden they can't be there. You want their backup that has similar philosophy and skill set. Right? Find out. Do the people that back them up have similar skill sets so you know you're educated ahead of time so when it happens, you're not so surprised. Is delayed cord clamping routine and for how long? All right, so delayed cord clamping is after the baby's born, your baby's still attached to the umbilical cord, which is still attached to your placenta that is still within your body, okay? Because your placenta is attached to the uterine wall. The blood that's in your placenta is your baby's blood. All of it. It's just been in a closed circuit. So after the baby comes out of your body, your placenta knows. It's so smart. It's all about survival. The body and the baby. It's amazing. We'll pump the rest of the baby's blood into the body. And when it's emptied, this thing will go white. It's usually real purpley looking when babies are born. It'll go more white. And it stops pulsing. So that's your placenta going, okay, I'm done. And then that's a great time to cut. So delayed cord clamping on average is about three to five minutes. Sometimes it will take up to 10. Um, so that's your baby's blood. Like about 30% of your baby's blood is in that placenta at the time of birth. We want that blood to get into your baby. Okay? Lots of stem cells in there. Lots of red blood cells there for your baby. Helps your baby. Okay? Um... Is skin to skin with my baby immediately after birth routine? This should be routine for everyone. All moms that birth a baby should have a baby right here. And then when it comes time, partners should also have the skin to skin with baby. Babies should live right here on the parents. But specifically right after you deliver baby. I don't care if it's a vaginal birth. I don't care if it's a cesarean birth. Don't matter. Get your baby here. This is important. For your baby to knock around on your breast, stimulating your brain. Hey, I'm out here. Produce, start producing this milk for me. But also kicking down onto your uterus to get that uterus to clamp down so we don't hemorrhage. This is super important for postpartum recovery immediately after baby. And we're being robbed of this because our babies are taken off to something over here with a little bed warmer thingy over there and weighed and measured. Your baby does not need to be weighed and measured in the first few minutes of life. Leave that for later, okay? Your baby needs to be right here the first hour or two. This is what we're doing at a hospital. It should just be across the world. So we need to advocate it. How we get change in things is we come together as a group and we keep talking about it and we keep mentioning it and we keep creating that change. Right? For more natural. Our bodies are amazing. Women know how to birth babies. Babies know how to be born. We work together and we have a baby. We're too much um, in the environment, social media, and society about all the reasons why we can't and we're not able. Mm hmm. Think about it. What things are you hearing? What things are you scared of? 
How fearful are you of having childbirth because of what you've heard in your past? Where is it coming from? Who's telling you that? Where are you getting these ideas from? If you have a lot of anxiety, stress, and fear around childbirth. Get around the people that are going to give you positive stories. Who are going to educate on the reasons why. Or maybe you need resources so you understand some things. Right? This is important. This is your body, your birth, your experience. And you're going to talk to, to whoever. Or maybe even tell your own children for the rest of your life. 20 questions to ask your healthcare provider. Get those wheels turning. Have healthy conversations. These are the people you chose to have on your birth team. Do you have the right birth team to get the birth you desire? If not, you need to make some changes. Okay? A couple of things I'm going to start. Y'all can start piling some questions on. A um, couple of things. A couple of things. You, yeah, I've said that like three times. I'm thinking. Thinking in my head. <laughs> my wheels are turning. <laughs> okay, so the natural birth booklet. How to get the birth you want. This is $3.13 PDF. All expecting parents should have it. Gives you nine successful actions to get the birth you want. Literally, you guys, a little tiny booklet, and it's like 35 pages long. It's a very quick read, precise to the point, because we got things to do. We don't have time to sit down and read unless you're a reader. But most of us eh, aren't. Okay. Uh... That's on ChrisyaCrosley.com. Everything I do is on ChrisyaCrosley.com and it branches out from there. Okay, so if there's anything I mention, you can always find it from there. Um, how to Get the Birth You Want Academy course is an online course you can go through to learn more in-depth stuff. Highly recommend for first and second trimesters. If you're a little bit fearful right now in your third trimester, you can still do it, but it's really for first and second trimesters until you get to that third trimester and wanted to train for birth. So that's my train for birth workshop. I have that on sale right now. So it's today and tomorrow for my virtual train for birth workshop. It's 109 videos pre-recorded, or 107, I've already lost count. 107 pre-recorded videos. The content is about totals three hours. So you can totally get through it in a day or two. If you're 38, 39, 40 weeks, it is not too late to train, especially if you want a natural birth experience, right? 34 plus weeks is the training. There's programs in there of actually the exercises and trainings you need to do to prepare your body and your mind to labor your baby across the finish line. Gives you comfort measures from the partners. It also um, tells you exactly what to do, what, when in labor, based on what your body's doing in labor. Okay? I encourage everyone to do it. It's amazing. It's on sale for $119. So if you're in your third trimester, you have six months access to it. I go in there once every three weeks. So my next time I pop in for a live huddle up is on the 15th, which is next week. And I train, I share positive birth stories, and I'm there for questions for you. You have access to me on chat through the platform, which is amazing. It's awesome. Go read the reviews, trainforbirth.com. Get signed up because the sale ends tomorrow night in the day. Okay? Um, what else? I also have a postnatal bundle, which goes over postpartum breastfeeding and baby care. So if you want to be educated on that, it's not emphasized as much. We're all about childbirth, childbirth, childbirth. Yeah, postpartum breastfeeding baby care. I also have an ultimate bundle in there that you can go watch as, as well as far as education and guides, okay? Um, so check that out. That is my Krisha Crosley Academy, um, where everything is kind of centered. Again, you can find everything through KrishaCrosley.com, okay? Um, before I start answering questions, I really want to tell you how appreciative I'm of you. I really enjoy and appreciate, basically love you all, <laughs> because you share my knowledge with everybody else on your platforms. You tag the people that you also want to share this information with, which makes a huge difference. Y'all are helping me achieve my goal, which I create very big goals for myself because I can, I'm able, and I am have a big humanitarian heart and want to help as many people on this planet as possible. And y'all doing that for me, it, it helps me reach my goal of reaching all expecting parents on the planet. Okay? It doesn't matter if there's a language bearer. It doesn't matter if 
there's a sea barrier if, where they are. Y'all are helping me do that because y'all can translate into their own languages. There's always someone that can translate something. So thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me achieve my goals. Okay? All right, so let's do this. Let's do some questions. Back up a little bit. I'm going to do Instagram first because sometimes Instagram likes to cut me off and then sometimes Instagram doesn't. Okay. And then I'll take Facebook. All right. Oh, and this recording, in case you popped on late, this recording will be available for 24 hours because I have people all across the world that like to watch and some people are sleeping and some people are working or whatever. So you have 24 hours to watch this video for your knowledge. Okay. So if you know anybody, let them know, tag them. Hey, watch this. It would be great. Okay. Okay, breathing techniques I teach and train for birth workshop. Uh, see, these are terrible. All this depriving you of food. Yes, yes, yes. The question is, can I still ask these questions for a VBAC? Absolutely. Yes. That's even more important for you VBACs because there's a lot of hospital. It is policy that they don't do VBACs in the, in the hospital. If you want a VBAC, you have to find a hospital that will do it. The reason they're denying VBACs is because they don't have an on-call anesthesiologist in hospital at all times. So they're just like, eh, we're not doing VBACs, so we don't have to have that pay going out to just keep somebody here for a just-in-case. I know it's sad. I'm really sorry. But VBAC can also happen at a hospital. You don't have to VBAC in a hospital. You have options as far as home and birth center births in most states. Not all states, but most states and probably some countries too. Uh, if you want me to help you with finding a doula in your area, which I highly recommend, doulas, birth doulas are knowledgeable in the stages and phases of labor, providing resources for you so you can make educated decisions, and um, being there for your labor and helping you through labor, birth your baby, and postpartum. And we all have different skill sets, so uh, we all have different payment ways and methods and costs so you need to interview as many as possible find that perfect doula that matches what you want so she can come along and help you get the birth you want um, but if you need help you need to dm me your uh, zip code city state zip code is easier for me to search for you i just so you know in january i start trading doulas virtually which is basically across the planet um, most of them signed up right now are in within the United States. So my plan is, because I've been training doulas in the DFW area, Dallas, Fort Texas area. Um, but my plan is to train doulas across the world in the train for birth skill set and then mentor and train them. And that way, when y'all answer me questions like this, I have doulas in other places than just right here uh, that I can refer to. Because I get a lot of, do you have a doula like me? In my area and I'm really sorry I don't know the answer to that question right now I'm working on it oh I love you too you're welcome how do you feel about placenta encapsulation I highly recommend it uh, it has really great benefits most of my clients have benefited for, from it Helps with breastfeeding support, helps with energy, helps with that hormonal dump you're going to have after having a baby, keeps it more consistent. Um, overall, it's good. If you have had postpartum depression, or not postpartum, if you've had depression issues before you're having a baby, I highly recommend it because it really keeps you out of that, the baby blues dump, and then it keeps you more steady, so it decreases your chances of postpartum depression. So I actually highly recommend it if it's a service that's done in your area. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. I appreciate the gratitude. What do you do for natural birth when your test positive for strep B? Have a natural birth. Doesn't change it. Go for it. At how many weeks is it safe to start exercising? Every single week of pregnancy. You should be exercising every single week of pregnancy. It decreases the type of medical situations that could pop in in that last month. It's preparing your body better for birth. It is helping your baby be ready for birth. 
It helps with swelling. It helps with so many different things. Weight gain. You should be exercising. Even if it's just a 30-minute walk every single day, that is exercise. What are some of your favorite methods of natural pain management? Squeezing a comb, tension and heating pads, etc. <laughs> Actually, it's these. <laughs> These are my, this is what people love, my clients love. Um, hip squeezes, putting pressure where she needs it, uh, holding her up when she needs it, maybe a leg, maybe a foot, maybe her hips, um, jiggling her. These are the most things I use. Um, probably after that would be water. So that would be shower, tub. It's great, great time to relax, let go, take the intensity off. Um, other things I do offer would be essential oils, would be, which would be aromatherapy. Uh, Tinge unit is offered if some moms like that. Heating pad, yes. Um, those would be other things, but these are the, the things that help the most based on my clients. Do you recommend induction uh, for someone with gestational diabetes? If you have been on point, with your diet and your hydration and your exercise, the answer would be no. If you have not been on point with those things, then you need to have a conversation with your provider. It would probably be a good idea to be induced. But if you're on point with that stuff and you changed the way you're eating to help you with that, I've helped so many women have natural childbirth with gestational diabetes and they've been on point with their food. Oh, good. Awesome. You're helping us achieve our childbirthing goals. I love it. Yay. You're very welcome. Uh, what are your thoughts on stripping membranes? Should I let my provider do it if I'm not dilated? Oh, they can't strip you if you're not dilated. No. You guys, I'm very natural birth leave your body alone type of thing. Let it spontaneously go into labor when it's ready. The thing about vaginal checks, one, every time fingers are inserted in your vaginal canal, it introduces bacteria. And then your body's gonna self-cleanse, self-cleanse, and self-cleanse because your body's self-cleansing because it knows to bring your baby through that. Your natural biome, okay? There's a reason for that. The other thing is sometimes when you strip membranes, it, you, you can break your sack of water, and if your body's not ready to have a baby, you're off to having a baby somehow, some way. Let's hurry up and get this baby out because now your water's broken. That's a risk, okay? Again, it could take multiple times for stripping. So it's not something I recommend. It's not something my clients do because the clients who hire me are the ones who want to go completely natural, no vaginal checks, no nothing. Okay, that's what I'm used to it. I see it over and over and over and over again. I am convinced. Women know how to birth babies. We just do. Because that's all I see. So, and it's also not, doesn't feel good. Mm -mm. It's not comfortable. But if you ain't open, there's no stripping. Because they can't get the finger in the hole to do the stripping. It's just, it's not there. It's not going to happen. Which, you're not, if that's the case, you're not ready to have a baby. Why are we, why are we doing that? Tips for a VBAC after two C-sections. Uh, you need to get cesarean scar massage. So there are places that can actually do uh, massage work on your um, cesarean area to release any type of adhesions or scar tissue. So that way your uterus can move well, your tissues can move well, and you can carry the next baby. It does help with your birthing experience. I recommend um, certified Webster, Webster certified chiropractors. Highly recommend them. Um, taking a full childbirth education class if you haven't already. Uh, get into some VBAC positive groups, successful VBACs. I have done a VBAC 3 before, all natural, amazing, birthed it like a boss. Um, it can happen, it does happen, but it's more important that you find a birth team that will help you get there and not give you all the excuses on, well, maybe, well, we'll see. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You got this. I know you can do it. We're going to do this together. That's the type of birth team you need, okay? Um, 
and go get it. You got to get your mind right. Train for birth. Get in the train for birth. I do V-backs all the time. I've actually started doing twins. You guys start training twins. It's very cool. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, social suicide. Send me a DM. I can help you with that. I can't help you with that right now. Feedback, feeling out of shape, quote unquote, and like my body won't have the stamina. Build that stamina. That's another reason why we exercise in pregnancy. It gives you energy. You have to get over that hump. It's here. Guarantee it's here. Push yourself. Get over that hump and your energy level is going to start changing and you're going to start feeling stronger and your stamina is going to go up. I'm telling you, I see it all the time. You can do it. You can do it. Been having lower back cramps but not dilated. Is that Braxton Hicks or can it still be a contraction? No, it's Braxton Hicks. Or it's dehydration. Get more uh, fluid in your body so your uterus will quit cramping. It's a muscle. Tips for fe feeling sluggish because of a lot of weight gain? Move your body. I know it sounds terrible. It's like a catch-22. I'm so tired. I can't move. But the thing to get you out of that is to move. Right? Set a goal. What is your goal? How far are you going to walk today? Get there. Whether it takes you one walk, two walks, or three walks, you achieve that goal. Is a VBAC 3 safer than another C-section? In my opinion, yes. Somebody else's opinion? Maybe no. Okay, you VBACers, you first-time mommies who could be at risk for higher cesarean based on your location and where you're birthing at, how many more children do you want? This is an important question, right? So you need to, a vaginal birth is best if you plan to have more children. It's super important, okay? If you plan to have more kids, you really want to have those vaginal births, so you want to get around the people that are going to help you get those vaginal births. Difference between a doula and a midwife. Medically trained. Midwives are medically trained. They listen to your heart rate. They listen to baby's heart rate. They do your blood pressure. They do your vaginal checks. They do your labs. Take your blood tests. They do all that. Doulas don't do none of that. Midwives catch your babies. Doulas don't. Doulas are like the outside of the body. The midwives are the inside of the body. So for doulas, we provide comfort measure support, physical, mental, and emotional. We give you resources. We educate you. Uh, we help you with your birth plan. We join you first, labor you down, and then call the midwife in or take you to your birthing location. Okay? We stay up until the baby's delivered, and then some of us have extra skills like breastfeeding support, postpartum doula, or belly binding, and things like that. So we all have different skill sets, but that's the difference is medical training. What well, causes water to break no contractions after, in my opinion, it's a malpositioned baby. Baby's in the wrong position. Baby's like kind of wiggling, trying to move. Baby nicks the bag. How much is my doula class? Like, what do you mean by that? Can you please clarify that? How to make sure baby is in anterior position and not position besides ball exercises. Uh, so baby anterior means the baby's back is on the front part of the body. Posterior means the baby's back is, is on the back side of mom's body. This is a harder delivery. We don't want posterior babies. Yes, they can be born vaginally, but it takes a lot longer. We want babies born like this on the front part of the baby because that's how they rotate in the pelvis and through a lot easier based on how the pelvis is developed. So, kicks. You should have kicks up in your rib cage, just like this. You should have flutters down by your pubic bone, but kind of inside, back in the middle of your body. If you are having kicks right above your belly button, front and center, that's a posterior baby. Your back may ache also a little bit, depending on 
uh, how far along you are. But we want kicks up here. If you have a midwife, they will be palpating your belly for position. You can always ask them to palpate uh, in the third try. And um, doctors don't normally palpate, but occasionally you might have a good one that does. Okay? And I guess ultrasounds could tell too if you're in that kind of thing. What do you recommend eating while going through contractions and labor? I actually have a reel on it. I just posted a couple weeks ago because I went to the, the uh, grocery store and videoed it. So there's lots of examples on there to help you eat bites. Okay, so I would encourage you to go look at that. Okay, what was the acronym for the water breaking? COAT, C-O-A-T, color, odor, amount, time, or people like to use taco, time, amount, color, odor. I don't like tacos, so I use coat. I like coat, protected coat around your baby. That's what I do, okay. Okay, so best foods to eat in labor since many of y'all are asking this. Um, anything that's not acidic. Anything you don't mind throwing up. So this could be bites of chicken. This could be um, nut bars. It can be oatmeal. Uh, it could be mac and cheese. It could be potatoes. It could be um, no nitrate, no nitrate uh, lunch meat. Uh, it can be cheeses, bananas, grapes, peanut butter, almond butter, rice, bone broth, labor soup. Um, anything. I mean, there's no wrong answer, uh, except acidic food, because if you eat something acidic and then you throw it up, you're going to burn all the way up your esophagus, which is no fun, you know, because sometimes people throw up in labor. It's part of it. Uh, how do I properly time my wife's contractions? I know start of one to start of next and with an app, but how do I know if she's in the thick of labor? So that's a good question. Um, Honestly, I don't encourage timing contractions unless they get like down to five minutes apart. If they're seven, eight, nine, ten minutes apart, y'all should be resting or sleeping. Like there should be no timing because you're you're just putting yourself on a clock. So when it's time to change locations to birth your baby or call your midwife out to your home, whatever you're doing, her demeanor is going to be serious. Her eyes are going to be closed. She's going to be bent over. She's not going to move. She's not going to have conversations with you. She's going to be breathing heavy, more than likely moaning, swaying her hips around. You're going to, she's going to have bloody show coming out of her body because that bloody show is the cervix opening up with the capillaries breaking around the cervix. Um, she's going to be really close to the ground. You guys, here's another thing. So you know all these videos where you see these moms like dancing around and they're in labor? They ain't in labor because they're happy and they're, they're upright walking around, right? She's going to be like, ah, ah. She's going to be down to the ground in labor. That's labor. Not up high, smiling, carry on conversations. The whole demeanor, the whole body changes. Her body will ground her to the earth to have the baby. Okay? So that's how you would know that. Great question. All right. I'm about to end off, you guys. I'm going to see a few more. Is age a factor for high risk? Absolutely not. You're welcome. Oh, look at there. You asked it on both platforms. I answered it finally. So what's your opinion on drinking raspberry leaf tea? Does it hold any truth? It does for some, but not for all, right? Remember, we're all different. We're all different bodies. We're going to react differently. Um, it may wait for one. It may work for one mom, and it may not work for the next. So what raspberry leaf tea is is a uterine tonic, so it causes the uterus to like tone and get a little crampy. Well, some of us get a little too crampy, and if it makes you too crampy and you're not sleeping or you're irritable or it's bothering you too much and wearing you out, stop drinking it. You're just wearing yourself out before labor even gets here. It could be a few days. It could be a few weeks. It's not worth it. 
okay? Your body's amazing. It's just another one of those things that are thrown out there, even just like my posts on the dates today. Yeah, my clients who eat them religiously, boom, spit babies out. But they also train. They also see a chiropractor. They're also fully educated. It's like part of the whole system that they're doing, right? It's just a natural thing. I just swear by the dates. It's like the one thing I swear by. Don't swear by the raspberry leaf tea because it's a hit or miss from mom to mom. So if you think it'll work for you, go for it. If you don't, and you try it, and you're like, eh, I don't like it, I can't get it down. You guys don't force stuff down you don't like. Your body's trying to say, hey, nah, -uh, that's not for me. It's okay. You don't have to because everybody else is. You do your own thing for you that works for your body. Do midwives check your cervix if you're dilated, if you want one? Not always. Some do, some don't. It's up to you. Vaginal checks are optional. In some environments, they make you think it's required. It's not. I think we're going to end off there. Okay? All right. You're very welcome. I appreciate all of the questions and the feedback. I will, so I know I didn't get to everyone's questions, so what I'll do is I'll put a, hey, ask me a question thingy on my story tomorrow, and if you didn't get your question answered, remember if it's medical, I won't answer it, um, I will answer it tomorrow, okay? I really appreciate you guys. Again, take advantage of further knowledge. There's a whole bunch of knowledge out there. Surround that birth team around yourself so you get your birthing experience that you want, okay? Healthy mommy, healthy baby, labor on. ChrisyaCrosley.com. See ya. You'll have a great holiday, and hey, I guess I'll see most of you next year. Bye. <laughs>